I think we're probably going to take about half an hour, Bryce, aren't we? So I'd like to get into the question and answer very quickly. Could I ask those of you at the back to come to the front, please? So at least it feels like we're a, a, a coherent group. <laughs> You can always ask. Yeah, come on, come, come, come forward. And while you do that, um, I'll introduce myself very quickly. I think a lot of you know who I am. Andrew Reichard, I'm chairman of Barclay Energy Africa. We manage, Barclay Energy manages two funds, uh, one in Asia, one in Africa. The only thing Barclay does is renewable energy connected to the grid. Um, our funds in uh, both Asia and Africa are majority DFI funds. We have some of our... Uh, LPs here in the room, but we do have important representation of, of um, uh, private LPs, as institutional LPs as well. We're still raising money for our Africa Fund, so if anybody's interested, um, we will come and make a presentation to you like a shot, um, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, the only other two things I'd say about myself are in addition to conventional institutional equity, I am an impact investor. I make business angel investments in startup companies that serve, uh, that are looking to exploit the potential to provide electricity to mass consumers in Africa, often called the base of the pyramid, who are not connected to the grid, of whom there are somewhere between five and 700 million people, something like 70% of the population of sub-Saharan Africa doesn't have electricity which is a major challenge. Um, I advise other infrastructure funds, and I'm on the board of two um, conservation and sustainable charities. That's me. That's my involvement in African <laughs> infrastructure. I'm going to ask Patrick and Stephen to talk about who they are, what their involvement in African infrastructure is, and um, then I'm going to make one set of remarks, and we're going to go straight into Q&A um, to try and keep you awake. And if it flags, then it's over. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, Patrick. Hi, my name is Patrick Landy. I am here representing uh, uh, ABREC, the African Biofuel and Renewable Energy Company, which is a, um, an international organization based in uh, Lome, in Togo, uh, fu funded by African governments, so African states and African financial institutions, and whose mission has been catalyzing, basically, uh, thinking, conceiving, originating, sponsoring, and finding funding for both private sector and public sector projects. Um, and they are, um, they, they, they vary from on-grid energy to uh, more biofuel-related projects, and they, 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 they vary from private sector initiatives like um, funds, where they, they were one of the, uh, one of the uh, a, a partners of, uh, of Berkeley Energy and Arif, but also, the, for example, the company is managing the West African uh, uh, project called uh, ERED, which is an initiative for rural electrification, uh, sponsored by the Commission of the West African Union. So I'm here representing them. My background in Africa has been, what, almost a decade now. Um, I've done many things of manage a private equity fund at a firm called Sink Invest. I've launched, always within that firm, the first ever uh, frontier markets fixed income fund, UCITS frontier, market, UCITS, uh, uh, frontier markets fixed income fund. That was a UCITS fund. I've worked with Christopher at a, a company called Exotics, uh, which is uh, one of the sort of eminent um, frontier market investment banks. So I've done various uh, uh, various things in, in, in Africa and uh, I suppose in infrastructure and renewable energy uh, in particular, uh, I've been behind this initiative, the initiatives of ABREC for, for many years now. My name is Stephen Breben. I work with DWA. We're pension fund advisors. I specifically focus on the liquids area. I go out searching for private equity, infrastructure, private debt managers and help pension funds build up portfolios. I'm pretty much agnostic whether something's in Africa, uh, the west coast of the US, China, or Europe. What I'm looking for is quality managers. And there was a comment earlier today about how operational experience is important and that we're now seeing that in Africa. The comment was made that actually it's happened now in Europe and now it's beginning to happen in Africa. Uh, didn't get the chance to say that this morning. That's wrong. It hasn't happened in Europe. 
It's the operational experiences coming into African private equity managers and infrastructure managers on a higher level than it is in Europe. And for me, that means that uh, I haven't invested in Europe in, well, since uh, mid-2007, and I'm more likely to invest in Africa right now than I am in Europe in private equity. <laughs> and infrastructure, we've been talking today about uh, what's Africa rising, what does it mean, talking about the possibility of manufacturing, what that means. There might be a little bit too much emphasis on hard manufacturing. Probably the manufacturing for the future is software and coding. So that is a great opportunity for Africa. But everything you, that you've heard this morning, throughout the day, is completely irrelevant without this panel. Because without the power and the energy to drive it all, nothing else happens. And the transport and the water and all the, and, and all the other elements of infrastructure. And in fact, yesterday we had, a, we had an informal conversation that some of you attended and we had an absolutely spellbinding intervention by Ernest Thompson of uh, the Social Security and National Insurance Trust in Ghana, who is a very prominent um, uh, fund manager. SNIT is one of the two biggest pension funds in, in public sector pension funds in Africa after the one in, um, after the public import government employees pension fund in South Africa. And um, he was finally goaded by a whole load of ignorant people like us talking about his continent and his country to say, if I want one thing for Africa, it's infrastructure. Because if we don't have the infrastructure, everything else, as, as Stephen says, is irrelevant. So I'm, I'm, I'm violently agreeing with, with Stephen. Investing in infrastructure in Africa is a bit problematical because if you want to invest in infrastructure in Europe or North America, there's a thriving secondary market in assets. In Africa, if you want to invest in them, you've got to make them. Uh, and and um, I've been in, in project development now for 15 years. Uh, and in my view, and I, I'll, I'll just throw this out, the big issue in getting infrastructure projects built in developing countries in general, but in Africa in particular, is that the investors who are supposed to come up with the money are risk averse. And they... Uh, and they decline to commit into projects unless they are fully developed. What does fully developed mean? Well, um, development means buying the site, assessing the resource, doing the market, the environmental studies. Um, if it's a conventional power plant, doing the fuel studies and getting the fuel supply agreements. Paying for the lawyers to document all these contracts negotiating with governments and government-owned utilities as off-takers of the power and documenting those contracts, um, completing the engineering specifications for building the thing, configuring it, deciding what equipment to buy, buying the equipment from the manufacturers, finding the, um, the civil engineering contractors to build the thing, and then, not least, negotiating with the banks and paying the outrageous costs they ask for before they've even made a commitment. You have to pay their due diligence costs whether they make a commitment or not. Now, developers and sponsors in Africa just don't have the funds to do that work. It takes time, it costs money. So the situation is that developers can't get money till they finish development, and they can't do the development without the money. And that's a catch-22. And um, I have a question to you in a minute out there and to my fellow panellists. Do you recognise the problem? How can things be done differently to, in Africa to address it? And, and the title of this panel, how does one get money into projects? Before we go there, um, we're a small enough group. Can I just ask you to put your hands up? Who here is... Uh, is there anybody in the room who is a project developer trying to get infrastructure projects built in Africa. I'm one. And, and so we've got two others. Can we get the mics and can you tell us what kind of infrastructure development you do? Thank you. I'm developing it from the financial side. Um, there are two projects. One on renewable energy and the other one on housing. Um, um, let me take the housing one first. The, the problems that you just outlined are very real, and this I'm talking about this in Ghana. What 
I have decided to do is to look at all the, um, all the parties that can deliver all the items that you, you listed. Okay, so we've got, to, we, we got the actual contractor, we got the, um, the, the institutional and individual buyers of the house, and so you are looking at the demand side closing in, and then you, are also, uh, you also have to look at, I'm sorry, we have also looked at um, uh, the, the mortgage institutions that will take over the debt, you understand? So what we have done is we've tried to structure it and make sure that um, an investor can come in and exit at a very short you know, uh, point. So right from the development point of view, um, uh, we've looked at all the documentation, the land acquisition, um, legal documentation and everything. Um, the demand is given with some kind of employer backing, okay, for the for the real real estate ones, and then for the institutional ones, some of the universities um, and other institutions that require such uh, infrastructure have also given their corporate um, kind of guarantees and all that. So the demand is pretty given, and then the debt sell down is also guaranteed because. Uh, mortgage houses, mortgage banks have also given their initial commitments that once the houses are built and, and delivered, um, they will take over the debt. So you, but you, you basically are able to raise money against a guaranteed takeout Absolutely. when you finish. So what you need now is just a construction finance to do the construction and then um, the, the, the investors into that can exit after the, the construction is completed and the houses are delivered. Thank because you. We could, we could spend the whole session going into detail, yeah. but forgive me, I'm going to ask the gentleman behind you who's also in infrastructure to tell us what he does in infrastructure. Hi, my name is Sean Kasmut. I recently came back from Africa touring 24 countries out there to understand the local content and the security hazards out there. I'm in the process of opening up a close protection security company and offering services in the petroleum, nuclear, gas markets throughout Africa and the Middle East. So obviously, to go out there and understand Africa as a whole, because local content, when I say local content, means the local individuals to understand the areas and the volatility and kind of sustain the environment to bring things together. So that's what I'm doing in a nutshell. Okay, and then I'll switch from developers to financiers of infrastructure. I know there are at least two here, uh, but can we have a show of hands from people who finance infrastructure? Colin, Yvonne... I know old mutual do, so you've got to put your hand up. Okay. Um, so there's three financiers, and I. So can I just ask, what are the rest of you doing? <laughs> why, why, why are you? What do you want to find out? Those of you who are not in the business, not us, can we have some questions from the lay people? What, why? Well, I guess why are you here in what really is the graveyard slot, and what, what, what are you looking for us to tell, to tell you or to find out, Christopher? We're here because we know Patrick Landy and he's done great work in the past and we think he can do great work in the future. Josh, that's okay. <laughs> okay, that's a plot. Anyone else over on this side of the Anyone else on Anyone this side of the room? <laughs> Anyone at all? Yeah, you, sir. You were in the previous panel. I was indeed. Um, look, I mean, a lot's being said about infrastructure in Africa and... Uh, there, there's so many white elephants, you know, um, out there that my question is, how does this thing get hand and feet, right? How? Because everybody goes on, you know, we're not going to have sustainable long-term growth. We're not going to have uh, Africa's just going to, it's just a commodity story having co come and gone. And the thing that's going to keep the momentum going potentially is investment infrastructure. So I'm, as an economist and as a, as a, as a, as a, somebody who lends uh, government's money, uh, effectively, obviously, infrastructure is what's going to pay me back. My, my question is, is it happening, right? Is it, are we seeing real infrastructure projects? I'm sorry, I'm not necessarily the greenie hugging a tree, uh, you know, even nuclear, anything, right? Is it happening? Is the money that I'm seeing slotted as capital expenditure on fiscal, on government's fiscal uh, numbers, 
Is that real capital? Are we seeing real capital? I mean, if you, ri if you drive around Nairobi, etc., you do see some new roads, but then you go to capital, what the hill, and it's just completely crazy roads, right? So, so I'm, I've, I'm seeing mixed evidence, so my question to you guys is, is it happening? Yes, and that's a, that's a great question. So I'll put it to, to Patrick and to Stephen as to, to answer. Uh, if I may, I mean, last week, um, I've just come back from a, a conference in the Middle East, or a conference, an event, a signing event, where you had the, the, the heads of eight African states, um, which signed for $17 billion, in a, was it, it was an MOU for um, infrastructure projects, where you had some, uh, basically, private equity companies, specialized private equity companies, and um, a developer from the Middle East, which belonged to the royal family of Abu Dhabi, um, developing for $17 billion in projects. So that was uh, you know, an actual signing, a fairly formal uh, ceremony with everybody there, the heads of states, Al Maktoum, everybody. But to me, the interesting point about that number is that out of that 17 billion, only 15% uh, was the equity tranche that was funded by the PE, the international PEs, and uh, the developer. Um, the 85% uh, uh, tranche was actually money coming from African banks. So what they needed was just a catalyzer and the expertise, but this was actually effectively an African-funded project. So I think this is a perfect example that these things can happen, where there is also the money for home-groomed projects. It's just that they need to be catalyzed. You need a catalyzer, you need a vehicle, you need a, a, a leadership and vision. And really, this effort is the, is the result of a few men who, who've had the vision to say, let's use our money to develop our own infrastructure, but acknowledge that we may need help and expertise in, construct, in developing these assets and in managing them. Uh, two parts to your question. The first part, yes, it is happening. You've got the toll road in Nigeria from uh, Abuja to Lagos, and anyone who's travelled between cities in Nigeria knows that that toll road is more addictive than crack. Once you've done it once, you are never going to not use it again. And you've got the bridge, and you've got uh, shopping malls in Nigeria, in Kenya. It's all part of infrastructure. It's happening. It absolutely is. In terms of happening for more in the future and in power, um, we've, there is now a, a, an LNG plant in Nigeria. The, it, it, Dangote is um, working on a, an oil refinery. It's, he's also working on a tomato factory, which I think is more exciting, tomato processing factory, but it's not quite the same scale and it's not quite infrastructure, but it, it's, it's happening. <coughs> so it absolutely is happening. In terms of energy, uh, you look, look at Germany. Germany is the largest solar power generator in the world. Makes no sense whatsoever, but it's a great model. What happened was you had little mom-and-pop outfits that went around putting solar panels on houses, and then they would charge the users for the electricity they generated. They also had a feed-in tariff. You don't actually necessarily need out in Africa because you don't have a grid, so you can actually charge more for the electricity. And... <clears throat> the, uh, the developer there who's doing two projects, one is housing and one is uh, renewable energy, I suggest you combine them because the price of uh, putting solar panels on a roof instead of a regular roof is probably going to increase your costs by about 2 to 5%. So why not put all of those houses with solar panels from the start? And even if you can't connect them up to a converter, it doesn't matter. They're just there. They stop the rain just the same as a regular roof does. So put them in straight away. Once all of these properties had solar power, solar panels on them throughout Germany, that was the first stage. And this can be hundreds of little mum and pop operations doing this all over the country. This can be replicated throughout Africa. I don't care what country it is. I don't care how many countries there are. It can be done everywhere. Then you have the next stage. Someone else comes in and says, right, I'm going to buy up lots of these or all these contracts and I'm going to aggregate them. Then I've got diversification because I can do that cross-border, and I've got income coming across borders, and I can <clears throat> diversify by geography and exposure to the, uh, the solar power. You can diversify by uh, geography, by political uh, setup, and by solar radiation levels. 
Then they package that up and then there is a queue of Canadian, Australian and now UK pension funds waiting to buy this stuff. And right now they're paying up to yields of as little as, as low as 5%. You give them something in Africa where you can offer them a yield of 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, they're going to be beating down a, a path to your door. This is stages. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens incrementally. It can happen. Yeah, so, so, so the answer is it is happening. If, as, as an economist, you look at the big, the big aggregates and you look at the World Bank and IFC numbers and they'll do studies that say that to sort out the electricity deficit in Africa, they need to invest $45 billion a year and actually the amount being invested is somewhere between 15 and $18 billion a year. And the problem with that is the deficit gets worse and worse, so when you go out of Nairobi, the, words, the, the roads get worse and worse, even though there are some new roads. And when you look at, you disaggregate it and you look at who's doing the investment, remember that until the mid-80s, infrastructure worldwide was not a private sector game. It was a government game. Governments invested in infrastructure using taxes. And... Um, it's only since the mid-80s that we've seen large-scale privatization of infrastructure. So in Africa still, a lot of money comes from governments, and an awful lot of money comes from the development finance institutions. We would not have a business in Barclay Energy without FMO and Yvonne and her colleagues. And I'm going to give you, so I'm going to give you the floor in a minute, Yvonne, to talk from the perspective of DFIs, because the DFI movement is absolutely central to the, the, the development of infrastructure. What Stephen is talking about is also happening. There is private investment in infrastructure. And because of the fact that not enough is being built, that, that, that it, it should be an extremely interesting asset class for Australian, Canadian, and UK pension funds, it should also, in my view, be a very interesting asset class for African pension funds. Um, and in fact, Last year, the keynote at this conference was given by Elias Masalela, the, um, uh, the chief executive of the, at the time of Public Investment Corporation, which, which manages the government employees pension fund in South Africa, the $110 billion. And he was saying, we are going um, north of the Limpopo, we're going into private equity, and we're going into infrastructure. So again, as Stephen says, these things take time. Um, but it is happening. The, the development of a project, all the things that I talked about, from the time you sort of first identify the site and say, I'm going to put a wind farm there, or I'm going to build a toll road there, before you go into construction, you've got two years of work. And then when you go into construction, you've got two years of construction. So it's five years from when you start thinking about it to when it can be packaged, refinanced, and sold into the market. Um, I heard someone, sorry... Patrick, you say your piece and then we'll go to yeah, sorry. Yvonne. Um, and it also goes back to the point we keep on fundamentally making, which is which we must never forget that, you know, we keep on talking, it's like saying infrastructure in, you know, in, in, in Europe. Um, there are stark differences between the United Kingdom, which arguably has got a very poor infrastructure, and Germany, which has got a great infrastructure. Um, and if you go in a, in a country like Ethiopia, I mean, the, 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 the money that's being spent in infrastructure is huge, and this is arguably uh, uh, the model of an economy that is being driven by infrastructure development, a little bit like the Middle Eastern, or to a certain extent, uh, China has been driven by infrastructure development. Um, and, you know, we, we talk about the examples of uh, Kenya or, 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 or Nigeria, which are the typical examples that are... That are quoted, but I also think it's context, and there, there, there is clearly, a, a, you know, a latent backlog there. But there are multiple examples of many countries, or even countries like Gabon, that actually are are building incredible infrastructure, and it's being funded by by the government, is being funded by the people, and actually the a very good example of of a model for development of of infrastructure in any uh, developing or developed economy, for that matter. So it, 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 you have to differentiate between each country, because it's, it's comparing apples and pears, just my... Yvonne, would you like to talk about the role of DFIs in infrastructure finance? I don't think she's got a choice. You, <laughs> <both. laughs> you put me on the spot, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can you, ask a question instead. You give me such a broad topic, what should I talk about? 
<laughs> Infrastructure for DFIs. How, what, what percentage of your so, portfolio so are you putting in the that? The question behind you, is it happening? And what needs to happen to make it go faster? And I, and, and I know, for example, I've, I've debated with your colleagues the need for um, DFIs to stop behaving like banks and being desperately risk averse and only putting the money in at financial closing and finding ways to put money into earlier stage development to make sure that worthwhile projects happen, which wouldn't happen unless there was somebody to, to put up the money. Yes, because it's also our experience that really in infrastructure, especially for Africa, the availability of money is not the real problem because there are so many governments who want to finance infrastructure. There are so many initiatives, Power Africa, Renewable Energy, well, you know it. It's the availability of development capacity and of financiers who are willing to commit sizable amounts in early stages. Um, and of course, yeah, we want to play our role where we can. So we um, submitted a, a concept for a new sort of blended finance initiative for infrastructure, for energy, really, renewable energy, um, to a, uh, an innovation lab process initiated by uh, several governments. Mm -hmm. And to our own great surprise, our proposal reached the last seven, and we're going to present a, a further elaborated version of it within a few weeks in Geneva, and then we hope, it, hope to make it to the last one or two so we can spend a bit more time and effort to really work it out. But that, I think, would be a very interesting solution to this, um, to this issue. Thank you. Any more comments or questions from the group? Um, yeah, my name is Sean Dobedi, and I actually <coughs> run a company that's called New Gen Andrews. And we basically help angel investors to invest in Africa. So you mentioned the fact that you're investing as in your own capacity as angel investor. I'm wondering how do angel investors participate in infrastructure projects? Because they tend to be large and really out of reach in terms of the normal size that angel investors usually come in. But at the same time, we can see developments. Uh, you've got people in diaspora who have, who are sitting on <laughs> large amounts of money, and ISAs are not really performing very well. So how can they really get in that space? I, I think um, a, I'll I'll answer this if you if you don't mind. But um, the angel example. investments that I look at are in um, small small businesses, not large projects, who are um, producing uh, solar home systems who are developing um, uh, sustainable forestry projects, who are uh, developing smaller solar projects. So we're not talking about the need for tens of millions of dollars. We're talking about tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and because the, the point that Yvonne made just before you is that there are, there's no shortage of money. Um, and actually, I don't think there's any shortage of projects either. I think there are just lots and lots of great projects. Our fund, one of the things we were asked is, are you going to be able to invest it? Are there enough projects to participate in? The answer to that is, and, and we're talking about the narrow field of renewable energy, renewable energy projects connected to the grid. Yes, there are. There are any number of projects. So down to the level of um, uh, angel uh, or startup businesses. This is people trying to in effect, provide off-grid electricity using mainly solar technology. Solar panels, um, LED lights, low-energy fridges and, and, and uh, radios and, and laptops and other devices. Um, and I was involved with um, uh, several initiatives, uh, a, char a charity uh, called Global Village Energy Partnership. I was talking to CDC. And official money just has to jump through lots and lots of hoops. So if a company is looking to raise $200,000 and you want it from a development agency or a development ministry, the feasibility studies, the, the, the due diligence processes they have to go through will cost several hundred thousand dollars. It's absolutely ludicrous to spend $150,000 in diligence costs to invest $150,000. So this is about four years ago. I decided, 
well, what the hell? I can't, the, 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 the DFI model, the private equity model just doesn't work. It's got to be something different. So I talked to entrepreneurs and said, well, would you take a check from me? And they looked at me as if I was slightly crazy and then said, well, if you're serious, yes, yes, of course we would. Crowdfunding also. We need, def for, for your sector, we definitely need different instruments. We don't need, what we mustn't do is, is, is lose rigor. I, I mean, I think there still needs to be careful thought about whether the investments make sense or not. But to go through the, the detailed legal documentation and actually in, in, in startup businesses where nobody knows whether, whether um, the market will grow or not, to commission PwC or Ernst & Young to tell you whether the market will grow, it's sticking a finger up in the air. It's a waste of time. But for, an, for a government agency, it's insurance. Because if it does go wrong, then the officer can say, it wasn't me, I've got this piece of paper that, from P PwC that says it's okay. So I think when we, we are talking about money in bulk from the wholesale markets. What you're talking about is startup businesses, and that's a completely different subject, which we could devote an entire conference to. Oh, sorry, just to be very specific, I also looked at um, something called Homestream. Yes, that's Eric Gishar. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's one of the three um, people providing solutions to aggregate funds to invest in large infrastructure projects. That's, how, that's what I was talking about as well. I was talking about... I think that's a great idea. I, I really do. Okay, it's nearly seven o'clock, but we do have uh, uh, two more po points and questions. Okay, sorry, Go. apologies if you've already covered this. Uh, I might have missed it. So two questions in one. Uh, first of all, how does all of this dovetail with uh, Obama's Power Africa initiative, number one? And number two, do you come across any entrenched interest? Because certainly I know in Nigeria I've heard about the um, very... Um, about the diesel and uh, generator selling um, brigade who definitely mafia want to... Mafia, okay. <laughs> um, so, ha, you know, do you have any of those problems? Stephen, do you want to take that? Um, answering your second question, yes. I, 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 my brother-in-law is a civil engineer in Nigeria and I'm trying to sort out a solar panel company. This isn't, this isn't a big deal. We're talking tens of thousands. And... Uh, a lot of obstruction getting solar panels into Nigeria. And it, it's an issue. And I'm in the ridiculously fortuitous position that uh, I'm working with big private equity groups. And so I can turn to them and say, what do I do? How do I do this? And they're going to direct me to the relevant people to speak to. Your average guy isn't able to do that. And one of the questions you're saying, uh, you were you had ready was you know, what can we do to make this happen? Yeah, Nigeria is a classic. You still got eight deaths to get through in customs. Yeah, and each one the uh, the bribe you've got to give uh, it gets higher and higher. It's just an inefficiency. My wife's Nigerian. She she looks at bribery uh, as a lubricant. She's very relaxed about it. To me, I, I kind of get that, but in some cases it's not a lubricant. It's an obstacle, and it just stops things from going away. And frankly, being blunt, if there was one desk where I could go and talk to someone and say, how much do I have to pay to get this in, I would happily do it. But if I've got eight and uh, each one is contingent on what I've done before, then I, I can pay seven and then fall at the last hurdle. It's just not worth the effort. So, yes, obstacles do then. Okay, Nigeria is probably worst, but it's the biggest market. And it's, uh, so it's this one I'm going to work with because, again, I'm going to come back to maths. Their issues are there. They're not insurmountable. It's just keep going. Patrick, do you want to talk about Power Africa? Uh, no. Well, then, uh, <laughs> sorry. I, I know I'm uh, I, I will about talk. It, so. I will talk about. I will talk about Power Africa <laughs> yes. because uh, Barclay Energy, my company, is a Power Africa partner, and we're working on one of their priority projects in Ethiopia. I think it's absolutely brilliant because it kicks it, it's, there's not a great deal of money there, but it kicks it up the agenda and says it's important. I mean, the, the UK, I'll, we, in, I'm, I'm a British citizen, there's a huge amount of debate about should the UK contribute 0.7% of its GDP to development or not, or, 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 or should it be spent on poor people in the UK? Obama stands up and says, it is a scandal in a civilized world 
we're not a civilized world, that three quarters of the population of Africa don't have electricity. I just wish that Ed Miliband and David Cameron would do the same, because that is a moral reason for the West to spend its money. There just isn't enough, in my view, um, uh, publicity, politicization of the fact that infrastructure is so important. And if you want to know why, why Africa is poor, and you ask the Africans, somebody like Mr. Thompson yesterday, the first thing he'll say is infrastructure. If we're going to grow, we need the infrastructure. So um, while I don't think there's an awful lot of new money in Power Africa, I think the fact that it's making a noise is absolutely great. And if everybody else would do it, maybe it would start to, to change the mindset. When the discussion started, I think there was a focus on private initiative. But along the line, it got shifted to the macro side. And um, as Yvonne I mean, came in, uh, she made mention of the fact that governments in Africa as well um, do a lot of investment in that area, and therefore money is not a problem. But I think that money is a critical hindrance, especially when we are looking at the private sector initiatives. And uh, because the government sectors, I mean, government have not been able to look at all the key areas. So the private sector initiative comes in to augment government efforts. But there is a, a, a lack, a complete lack of funding, even when the initiative has been developed <laughs> to a point, to a bankable point where funds can flow in. How can we attract resources in this area? And that is really my question. For instance, in the area of renewable energy, there is uh, in Ghana a project that has been developed to a point that it's even attracted or gotten the recognition of the World Bank. Um, the UNDP have all come in to give small, small, um, a little, little bit of amount towards the development, you understand, up to a point where it has been fully developed. Funding remains an issue. How can funding be attracted for such projects? Thank you. Well, that's such a difficult question. I'm going to hand it to my colleagues. <laughs> Uh, uh, again, um, I'll, uh, I'll draw, you know, just a very concrete example from just last week. So this is, um, I said, 17 billion, 85% financed to the maths, you know, by African finan West African financial institutions, banks, where the development banks, insurance companies, and clearly there was a political will to divert the balance sheet of those banks from buying treasury bonds to buying infrastructure debt. I mean, that's really the simple trick. So the problem, again, is not the money. It's whether it's the, at the start is the vision, the, 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 the program, uh, and the framework to do it. So I, if that project, uh, you know, between Cowbank uh, 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 and all the Ghanaian banks, I'm sure it can be funded, is whether there is locally, without the World Bank, without FMO, without anybody. Um, it's just, you know, are, are there the people in Ghana who are going to funnel some of the funds into that? That's basically the answer. And the, the, so you've got examples where it can be done. You can actually make uh, renewable, uh, sorry, infrastructure debt as a regulatory capital, allow it for banks, and so you can encourage them to a certain percentage, you can get them to do it there. For a certain amount of this is education, not just educational locals, educating uh, Western pension funds and telling them that the diversification opportunities that are there, and actually you don't want to be exposed to Greece, which cancels half its debt, Spain, which reneges on its feeding tariffs, uh, the US, which stops paying everything for two weeks. You know, the risks are everywhere, so why not actually diversify away from Western exposure to actually governments that are a bit more reliable as they are in Africa? Uh, and are going to pay I, I, I'm going to butt in because the clock is, is ticking towards 7 p.m. I, I will just finish with, and it, this is not strictly on the point, but it's to say that um, I've been in finance and investment now for 37 years. The last 20 years of that, I've been investing in infrastructure. 
So I've been involved in private power in um, Africa, Asia, um, and Latin America. I've, I've not, never actually done anything in Europe, despite being a European. I've just done emerging markets. Over the last 20 years, there has been a great deal of money lost by private investors in, um, in power infrastructure in emerging markets, but practically none of it in Africa. The vast majority of the money was lost in Pakistan, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, and in Argentina, when those countries ran out of foreign exchange in 98 or 2002 and came back to the private financiers to radically restructure the debt on those huge projects. In Africa, private investment in power infrastructure has run, by and large, pretty smoothly, and the Africans have paid their debts. Sometimes they've struggled, sometimes there have been delays, but nobody's really lost money in private power in Africa. So um, I'll second Stephen's point. If you want to have high return, secure investments in power, take the money to Africa. And let's leave it there, and thank you very much for staying till the bitter end.